Um, well, I'll be rethinking on your behalf uh, space time. So I, I'm a physicist, so I'm speaking on behalf of physics, but not quite all of it. Um, I'm a theoretical high energy physicist trying to understand gravity. And of course, gravity is a subject to which uh, our guest of honor has contributed in so many ways, so perhaps this is a little bit fitting. Um, let me try and jump in uh, straight away with two key lessons we have learned from uh, last century, um, which are very crucial to what I'm going to say uh, uh, afterwards. So firstly, with Einstein, uh, more than 100 years ago, we learned that space-time is actually even empty space is a dynamical entity. So there's a dynamic associated with it, and it has local properties, curvature properties. And these really encode what we, since Newton, have been thinking of as gravitational forces. So here is a, a very important equation in inverted commas, which just says, well, by virtue of gravity affecting everything in a universal way and everything else, everything being also a source of gravitational force, you can encode it into the fabric of space-time um, itself. So that's a, well, a profound way of rethinking space-time uh, that has been with us since those, those days. The second big lesson is that at a fundam fundamental level, all of physics truly, in its true nature, is quantum physics. So it's not classical physics, although this is often a good approximation, but it is described by own sets of laws, quantum laws of motion involving wave functions, probabilities, uh, operators, uncertainty relations, uh, you have it. Now, putting these two things together to arrive at what we call a theory of quantum gravity, which should be a fundamental quantum theory underlying the well-known and in its region of uh, uh, applicability, perfectly uh, uh, fine uh, classical theory by Einstein, uh, is, still not, is still lacking. So it's the missing, missing piece in our understanding of the uh, four fundamental interactions. And of course, a justified question is why uh, this is so. Now, OK, here we come to the experimental part of my talk. So, one of the reasons, or one thing that makes gravity very special is its weakness. It's really incredibly weak. So one way to see it is to have a little competition between a magnet, so which is one of my props here. It's so small you'll hardly be able to see it. Uh, and then I have a paper clip which doesn't appear here. So we have a little competition. Um, so, well, this is magnetic. So the elec you know, electromagnetic forces act uh, on this little paper clip. On the other hand, it has a mass. And of course, by its gravitational mass, the Earth will pull on it. Uh, and the Earth is a heavy, a heavy and heavenly body of about 10 to the 24 kilograms. So it's a little competition. So here's my little magnet. And here is a paper clip. And well, lo and behold, it wins, right? So <laughs> this just shows you how weak gravity is. We don't really ultimately know why that is so. But well, maybe that's in the realm of what things we can learn from physical theory, I, uh, we don't know. Um, so it's a loser, but not on all scales, <laughs> gravity. So there are two extreme scales where it actually is, is the winner. So here you see on a, on a logarithmic scale, um, well, all, all uh, length scales that are of interest to an ambitious theoretical physicist. So, you know, we're ranging from the largest, very largest scale, 10 to the, twi uh, 10 to the 26 meters, uh, that's the visible universe, the largest we can see, to this incredible, oops, this incredibly uh, small uh, Planck scale. So, everywhere here, now here, that, that's, that's us. Um, well, other forces dominate, uh, so in particular, if you go to smaller scales, you go to atoms, and because their electromagnetic forces are very important, you go even further, you resolve the, the substructure, the subatomic uh, particles inside uh, the cores of atoms where we have weak and strong nuclear interactions. And that's physics we can probe with particle accelerators. Um, so gravity doesn't really play any specific role. It's completely you know, outdone by these other forces. Now, 
we know that if you go to the very largest scales, gravity does become important and reigns supreme simply because, well, the electromagnetic forces that are kind of the other long-range forces, well, the, the, the charges uh, under which th th that need to be there uh, for, you know, electromagnetic forces to, to be felt, they kind of average out on very large scales and what's left over is just gravity. And, and even if it's weak, of course, the, you, there's still a lot of stuff in the universe and, uh, well, uh, it's well, very well described how this large structure behaves and uh, uh, by gravity alone. So that's larger scale kind of cosmology. Now, on the other hand, if you go to the very smallest scales, it's at least a plausible scenario that gravity will also win again. And at this really, really small scale, the Planck length that already appeared was mentioned on one of uh, Rogers' transparencies. So that's where we believe quantum aspects of the gravitational forces become important. So uh, this little picture just is, you know, illustrates a little piece of quantum space-time, which we'll hear more about. And yes, this is a ridiculously small scale. It's not accessible experimentally, and that is something that well, it has big consequences for the subject and how we go about uh, trying to understand what quantum gravity is. Of course, you might say, well, is it, can one actually learn something at this scale? So the, it's, it's a profound question whether we can push and extend our well, current ways of, of, of understanding, uh, our current ways we understand of, of, of principles, that, the physical principles that govern uh, physical nature of things, whether it really can be pushed all the way to these extreme scales. Now, why are we interested in quantum gravity at all? Well, there are very interesting questions that we would hope to be able to answer once we had such a theory. And uh, one of them, the one that, that is often quoted, is if we go back in our own history of our own universe, of course, it it, it gets smaller and smaller and denser and denser all the way back to the Big Bang, right? So, and of course, energy densities at very, very small distances, very, very far back in time, become so large that eventually the classical laws of general relativity will no longer be applicable to describe the situation, also not to describe space-time there. So, we expect that quantum gravity will take over. So, if we knew it, we could just, you know, extend our understanding some tiny, tiny fraction of a second further back uh, in time. So there are many interesting questions you can, you can ask. So is there, well, if you had a theory of quantum gravity, which would work, give some kind of dynamical description to what happens at these Planck in very short uh, scales, would it give us kind of a very fundamental first principles understanding of Newton's law? So even going kind of back uh, uh, from Einstein, where why do masses attract? Why, well, why do they attract? You know, and, and not repel. And well, many. It would be fascinating. It would be wonderful if we could do it. We currently cannot. Uh, and there's a whole range of questions that, if you believe in like something that is illustrated by this cartoon here. Namely, if you start off from just a piece of empty space or empty space-time, which is basically structureless, and then we zoom in with some imaginary microscope to ever smaller scales, uh, we will f maybe see some deviations from that flatness if we probe sufficiently small scales. And once we get all the way to the Planck scale, well, space-time itself should quantum fluctuate. So this is captured by this artistic impression. And people have all kind of speculations what might become of space-time at the Planck scale. So is it some kind of space-time foam? Uh, do wormholes appear? Do holes appear? Does the whole thing fall apart? Do we have something like uh, discrete atoms of space-time that then on larger scales somehow coalesce to give real continuous space-time? Well, there's plenty of speculation and intuition, which you should clearly mistrust if someone claims they have intuition at the Planck scale, mm -hmm. but very little evidence of, frankly, any of these things, or uh, like things like you know, wormholes associated things like, uh, like time travel. Now, if you focus in more kind of on the mathematical side of things, general relativity, is of course, is a beautiful theory, 
and with beautiful mathematics. And the question is, well, if we want to describe a structure like that, how will we transcend these classical notions? Will there be a notion of quantum geometry? What will it be? Is there a mathematical framework that's appropriate uh, uh, for describing this? So, of course, I don't have very much time, so I, I'll just give you a, a bird's eyes and very subjective uh, view or sketch what uh, the, the state of the art is. So, people have worked on quantum gravity for many, many decades, and very intensely, I would say, since maybe the 1980s. Um, despite of that, it's really still, well, our theories are at best incomplete. Yeah, that's putting it mildly. So making sense of the situation where space-time itself quantum fluctuates is still an enormous challenge. And to somehow formulate quantitative theories that even capture part of that situation. On top of that, well, there are currently no experiments or data to guide our search. Contrary to say what happens when quantum mechanics was invented or found. Uh, so, it <laughs> so there's nothing to keep us honest uh, from that point of view. There may be other, other things that do. Now, one thing it seems we have learned from you know, research of the last uh, uh, 30 or so years is that one, one includes uh, many exotic ingredients in an effort to find a theory that encompasses maybe not just quantum gravity but also the rest of the interactions the most prominent example of which is superstring theory. So if one has such formulations, they, they contain naturally, one is forced to include in them many extra exotic, well, what used to be a long time ago, exotic ingredients, we got used to them, like extra dimensions or supersymmetry. So things we haven't seen, but naturally appear as part of these theories, they, they team to lead to what I call an embarrassment of riches. So you have, in the end, so many free parameters in, in these theories that they, have, they, they lose any predictive power. So people have pursued also already for a, a number of decades alternative so-called non-perturbative uh, candidate theories of, of, of quantum gravity, but also these meet roadblocks that are, well, sometimes hard to tell whether they are of a purely technical or also conceptual nature. It's a mixture of both. Let me name two of them. So, uh, so they, they need to fit into what we already know. So, and one way of phrasing this is to say, well, if I take a classical limit, so some kind of large scale, low energy limit, um, somehow, you know, general relativity should reappear or things should fit smoothly without contradiction. Yeah. Um, so, although you might say, okay, you're not talking about physics at the Planck scale and you're saying there are no experiments, so, you know, anything goes. Well, that's not really true. So, there is, there is no free lunch at the Planck scale in that sense and you must show, and that is actually very difficult and very difficult to achieve, uh, that class, a classic limit exists. Second thing, that's a little bit of a technical point and so for some of you it may mean absolutely nothing, is that there is a a very big symmetry in the formulation of the classical theory, um, so-called diffeomorphism invariance, or uh, much more familiar as, well, the freedom to choose coordinates. In the classical theory, that is often considered as an asset, because I will just choose those coordinates which make my problem look maximally easy. However, when you come to the quantum theory, there are a pain in the neck, and that's putting it mildly. So it's really extremely technical in whatever approach you look at to ask, well, how do I implement this symmetry or how do I get rid of it in the quantum theory? So that has been really a, a, a stumbling block. Now, at a, you know, we were asked actually to state what are difficulties in our you know, theories. Well, it's that, right? So how do we then tell right from wrong? How do we develop objective criteria to even measure progress. So is there a genuine way in which I really can claim, you know, what we know now about quantum gravity is more than we did 10 years ago or 20 years ago? Well, ultimately, that's, that's 
that's hard to establish because where are the, you know, ultimately, of course, I should be, I should be making predictions, I should compare to observational experiment and then show, look, my theory is the better one. So it puts us in a very tricky situation and, of course, something one could talk about for, for, for much longer. Obviously, our ambition is to describe nature and make predictions and it's very, very plausible that such a theory should exist from all that we've learned from 20th century physics and before. But we are treading a fine line between science and speculation. Yeah? And it's, well, we have to monitor ourselves and be vigilant. Okay, so how could one deal with it? Well, one strategy I've chosen for myself for already some time is to try and get away from the, you know, from adding more stuff to the theory in order to understand it, rather asking how little can I get away with in terms of ingredients, in terms of initial assumptions I make, uh, symmetries I'm postulating, just a priori, in terms of ingredients of whatever fields, degrees of freedom I'm using. Uh, let's try and be as simple as possible, but not simpler, uh, in variation of a famous uh, adage, of course. So, um, what I've been pursuing is a candidate theory of, of, of quantum gravity, which I won't be have time to say very much about. It's called causal dynamical triangulations. That is a very prescriptive name because triangles will appear and they will have causal properties and there will be some dynamics to them. Um, now, this has given, first of all, uh, very good evidence that it has some good properties in a classical limit and one can make some statements of that about that classical limit. Very prominently, what I've really come to think of as almost the most essential thing of this approach, it solves the diffeomorphism problem, it really solves it, and it all has produced a, a number of, you know, a remarkable results, which if I had time, I could, you know, talk all day along, but I don't, about. Now, what is the key thing? Well, it's really about giving up smooth space-time and the associated uh, tensor calculus. So these are both familiar and extremely powerful uh, properties of the classical theory. And it's, you know, it's one of the things that I associate with people when they get a little older, they start claiming, wow, the whole world is discrete, it's obvious, etc. So, well, this is not quite as bad, because maybe I'm not quite as old, but, you know, getting there, obviously, but what I'm not giving up, note, is continuity. So, although there will be kind of discrete elements or non-smooth elements in this setup, uh, continuity is still there. And I should say, no one really in quantum gravity, dis despite trying, has really been able to make sense of just discrete, really kind of discrete atoms of space-time pictures. Okay, so what is the idea? Well, it's not mine. So the idea in physics, in, in gravity, was introduced by Tullio Reger in 1961. So it was called general relativity without coordinates. And that already gives you the hint, there are no coordinates. So <laughs> the freedom to choose coordinate, uh, coordinates has just disappeared. So the, uh, that's more or less the story, because it's slightly more complicated, but this captures the essence. So one uses continuous, but non-smooth, and so-called piecewise flat spaces, think of them as triangulated. So in two dimensions, <coughs> one would glue together triangles to make a kind of curved space, and you can do the same in four dimensions from four-dimensional building blocks. So if you took the English version of the book and went, had reached all the way to page 960, you would find mention of this and you would find e even a, you know, a, a very similar picture to this little building block here. Um, now, so, Reg's idea is very interesting, but really its full power becomes only apparent Firstly, when you use this in a quantum theory, and secondly, when you make another assumption, namely that you're putting together building blocks that essentially look all the same. And roughly speaking, about modulo, they are Minkowski characters, they are kind of equilateral. And you build your space times from these uh, objects. And what you then do, I'm cutting a very long story, very short, you're doing a quantum superposition. So you take a so called Feynman path integral of objects of space times you obtain by gluing these together. And you're not interested in these discrete kind of 
structures per se, but you think of them as a scaffolding that you will have to remove, so some kind of what you call a regulator, and uh, you are only interested in evaluating this path integral in the limit of infinitely many building blocks. In four dimensions, the mathematics to address this hasn't been developed, so it has obviously also combinatorial aspects, because I'm counting objects that I'm making from smaller building blocks, kind of in all possible ways, subject to some gluing rules. But what we do in higher dimensions, we study these with Monte Carlo simulations, and of course computational methods were also already uh, mentioned. So, uh, only one small insight I want to share with you that has arisen from that, and also that throws an interesting light on relation with mathematics. So you can ask yourself, okay, if, if I'm working with space-times that are you know, built from these triangular objects, well, they have all kind of corners and, and, and singularities uh, in them. So, for instance, wh wh what would curvature represent in this context? Well, uh, you know, if you compute uh, in general relativity, the Riemann tensor is kind of the essential object that contains all information about curvature. What I need to compute is, first of all, I need to choose some coordinate frame, and then I need a metric that's smooth, because this object contains second derivatives. <laughs> so and if the thing is not smooth, well, I will have singularities all over the place. So is, is there any notion of curvature? Of course, in terms of physics, one would argue, well, it shouldn't ultimately, on very small scales, should it really matter that things, if things were non-smooth? So one might think maybe, you know, from a, a naive physicist point of view, something like this ought to exist, some notion of curvature that holds for such spaces and then in the limits we are interested in. No one had thought about this in quantum no, non perturbative quantum gravity, and I have been wa had been walking around with this idea for a long time, until one day, I sit in a conference and there's one colleague of mine who talks about graph theory and how people come up with notions of curvature that works on graphs. And graphs are, of course, also kind of discrete objects that just you know, consist of, of vertices and links. And from there on, um, I discovered that there is an entire parallel universe not just within graph theory, but within mathematics, where people have been thinking, well, the last you know, 10, 20 years very intensely about how to generalize notions of curvature from classical Riemann context to, well, generalized geometries, much, much more general metric spaces, including things like graphs. Uh, so, well, I, you know, so there's one, so what is a nice notion that we used and adapted and were inspired by and copied from a mathematician, Jan Olivier, uh, a Frenchman, uh, he invented, you know, I don't know, like 15 years ago, but really also in a context where people do study all kinds of aspects of this curvature. Well, this is the key thing. Now, just put yourself in the smooth context and even in two dimensions, just to visualize what's what goes on. So what you do, you're sitting on a on a space with some positive definite uh, 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 signature, so like a Riemannian space. So you take two points, you draw geodesic spheres around those points, um, and then what you do is you compare the distance between the centers of these two spheres with the distance these two spheres have to each other. Of course, you have to give them a good, well, way, f you have to tell me what you mean by the distance between the spheres, but it turns out that it's not, it's neither difficult, there are various ways of doing it, they and they lead to similar results. Now, what then happens if you sit on a metric space with positive Ricci curvature, the distance between those spheres is smaller than the distance between their centers. And conversely, if you sit on a metric space with a negative Ricci curvature, the spheres would be further apart, kind of with respect to some averaging notion of what the distance between these two spheres constitute, than the distance of their centers. And the beautiful thing is you just need to be able to measure geodesic distances and volumes. And that you can implement on extremely gen general spaces, including quantum geometries in dynamic triangulation, causal dynamic triangulation, what have you. So we actually used and we constructed and used something we call quantum Ricci curvature. And I, I'm quite excited about this. And we are even applying it now in four dimensions. And we are measuring it with kind of numerical experiments from little 
quantum universes we are creating. Now, uh, that already gets me to the end. I'm running out of time. And I just want to finish on a few remarks. So this is the century of gravity, right? We have discovered gravitational waves. And we finally want to get to grips with understanding all classical and quantum aspects of this theory. So that's very challenging. And I've mentioned some of the real difficulties and, uh, with trying to do physics at these very extreme scales, trying to construct a series. So how do we really proceed in absence of quantum gravity phenomenology? So um, I sketched, I mentioned more one way of how this may work. So this is causal dynamical triangulations. But this may well not be the only way. Or there may be many, well, there may be other ways. Of course, we hope that if there is a theory of quantum gravity, it will be more or less unique, and there are maybe many ways of getting to it. So some kind of universality would be nice. Um, so this almost answers my next question. So have we reached the stage of ironic science, as some people have put it, where well, we're just so far away from any experiment that it's really just all you know, free lunch at the Planck scale, as I said before? The answer is really no. So it's not true that anything goes. So I mentioned one aspect of this, which is de facto highly, highly constraining. I mean, the requirement that quantum gravity has to fit with the rest of that we already know of the universe and, and, and the natural laws and the physical laws we already know about. Um, unfortunately, in the incompleteness of our quantum gravity series often means that one is completely unable to compute it and therefore say anything about this classical limit. So this model I, uh, I presented is somewhat of an exception. So here are some lessons. So firstly, well, pen and paper is beautiful, but is we are unlikely to get away only with those trying to understand quantum gravity. Um, using minimalist ingredients has led us so far, surprisingly far, in this particular approach. And we haven't met any big roadblocks at, at this stage. Now, lastly, um, well, really, you know, being so constrained, uh, yeah, what is progress in quantum gravity? Well, I think it, it comes from you know, tr trying to look at the same old ingredients from new perspectives and trying to find those perspectives. So that's what I mean by we think space time. And of course, you know, think independently. So uh, my own community, uh, contrary to what I might wish, is just, you know, as much uh, subject to uh, groupthink and related phenomena as, as anything else, sadly. So we have to guard against this. Now, I should say, um, in terms of thinking independently, I can hardly uh, think of any person who embodies uh, 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 this in the best sense of the word, as does uh, our admired colleague Roger Penrose. And I just wanted to say, uh, Roger, that you know, this has inspired me throughout my career since I've known you. And this is somewhat even independent of the contents of, of, of things you have talked about. So I think that's hopefully a good point to stop. And I thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Renata. I'm going to now go down the aisle and sort of channel my American talk show host <laughs> and see if anybody has a, a question for Renata. And now I can't see all the hands everywhere. Why don't we start here? So you have chosen an, uh, a discrete model at the smallest length scales. Uh, could you think of an experiment that could ultimately prove whether at the smallest length scales the uh, space-time is discrete or continuous? Yeah. So. Uh, well, I, I had tried to say, well, well, of course, many people mean different things by discreteness. So yeah. often when people mention, uh, talk yeah, about yeah, this, they mean, funda yeah. well, they mean yeah. fundamental discreteness. And again, well, before they say that, I mean, people use it often very unthinkingly. Uh, I'd like to, they should give us a, an operational uh, kind of definition of what that is, is supposed to mean. So what I'm presenting here, it's not like this. So it's continuous. And these little building blocks, they are, in a way, an arbitrary scaffolding. So it's like you know, using lattice, a lattice to describe QCD. Of course, you will rem and it's something you want to remove in the end. OK, so you're so saying the scaffolding 
does not exist in, re yeah. in reality. The scaffolding doesn't okay. exist. And dependence on the scaffolding should drop out. Okay. But it doesn't mean there, there ought to be, uh, to answer your question, I would hope that one can formulate observables. Yeah. that have, you know, uh, maybe certain things that have discrete spectra rather than, you know, geometric observables rather than, than continuous spectra. And that would be one way that is totally independent of the setup. In this setup, there might well be geometric operators with discrete spectra. We haven't found them yet. We haven't seen them yet. Okay, thank you. Mike is behind you. Is there any connection at all between these considerations and the results that four dimensions um, seem to have a very special property that you have these non-standard uh, differential structures and Donaldson theory and so on. It happens in four dimensions but not other dimensions. I, I, I don't see it. I don't yeah. see it because this is about microscopic structure and I, I don't understand. really see how it comes in in these mm. considerations and you know topological field theory considerations. What I do see and uh, is the more, well, I know about quantum gravity is that people often, of course, study these low dimensional models, two and three dimensional models. Yes. I mean, one has to be just extremely careful. I, I think they yes. it, it's a completely different ball game. And you're very, I mean, just to try to generalize from models like that to yes. four dimensions. It this this it would be a case where generalizing to small number of dimensions would give you the wrong answer. Yeah. And it seems to be the true, true also for kind of geometry or microscopic mm. geometry. Yeah. I that these are very different as dynamical systems. Yeah, I know, I understand it. So yeah. They're different. I well just wonder if there might be any clues from that which had a reflection in, in the sort of work you do here. I don't know, it's certainly off the top no. of my head. <laughs> no, I don't. Okay. Not at this stage. Thank you. It may be a stupid observation, but if you work with a four-dimensional space which is triangulated somehow, right, right. if I think in the two-dimensional analog, right. you can observe the curvature from the deviation between the sum of the yes. three angles of yes. the triangles yes. and the yes. providual yes. 180 degrees. Yes. And I'm not sure in your model whether you have corners at the vertices, but yes. if you would have them, you could presumably observe the curvature from the sum of the angles at yes. angles no. at that point. No, it honestly is an excellent remark because curvature, um, I don't have a picture now, but uh, in also in the retro picture, he, Im he envisaged, of course, as an approximate way of doing classical general relativity. And the curvature notion that is used and he used and introduced is exactly this deficit angle prescription. Yeah? Now, there are two reasons why this falls short in the, in the quantum theory. First of all, it's a relatively easy prescription when you just look at scalar curvature. But as soon as, if you want to, even in the classical context, if you want to construct something like Ritchie or Riemann tensor, it just, you just get very unwieldy, finite different uh, expressions that extend over, you know, highly non-unique and extend over kind of various building blocks. So it's not nice. But uh, a much more serious problem is that in the quantum theory, you see, when we take these limits, you know, when we shrink away the scaffolding, so effectively we shrink these building blocks to size zero. In that uh, limit, this deficit angle curvature just blows up. I mean, and it blows up, I mean, beyond any renormalizability. So it's not a good notion. And actually, when I started delving into the math literature, uh, some people also there, from coming from other angles, also understand that. So this Olivier curvature, which I presented a version of, has nice averaging properties. So if you go zoom out, you know, with these pairs of spheres, if you make them larger, and so you probe curvature on somewhat larger scales, it averages in a nice way over very, unwieldy, very non-classical, very singular structures that are there microscopically. So that's a very nice property it has. Obviously, these notions are non-unique. Um, yeah, so deficit angle is not good. N not good enough for us. 
Okay, wonderful. I think because uh, our coffee break ended like 10 minutes ago, <laughs> um, perhaps what we should do um, is save some of the further discussion with Renata for uh, later, although... Oh, yes, thank you very much. Sorry. Before you leave... Oh, yes. By the way, I, I can't accept Oops. any responsibility for making these happen. This is, all, this is all Hester, but I get to stand up and give people little gifts. So thank you oh, very much. Thank you so much. Thank you.